This is a video interview of Tony Hoare for the ACM Turing Award Winners Project. Tony received the award in 1980. My name is Cliff Jones and my aim is to suggest an order that might help the audience understand Tony's long, varied and influential career. The date today is November 24th, 2015 and we're sitting in Tony and Jill's house in Cambridge, UK. Tony, I wonder if we could just start by clarifying your name. Initial C-A-R, but always Tony. My original name, uh, with which I was baptised, uh, was Charles Anthony Richard Hoare. And originally my parents called me Charles Anthony. But they abbreviated that quite quickly to Anthony. Um, and always called, my family always called me Anthony. Uh, but when I went to you, um, school I think I'm, I moved informally to Tony and I didn't move officially to Tony until I retired and I thought Sir Tony would sound better than Sir Anthony. <laughs> right. If you agree I'd like to uh, structure the discussion around the year 1980 when you got the Turing Award. I think it'd be useful for the audience to understand just how much you've done since that award um, so if I could, I'd like to start in 1980 and work backwards, and later on uh, we'll come to 1980 and work in the more obvious order, if that's okay. That's fine, thank you. So the Turing Citation uh, lists four things, not necessarily in this order. The axiomatic approach, design of algorithms, specifically quicksort, contributions to programming languages in general, and operating systems constructs such as monitors. Let's begin with the axiomatic approach. Um, the key paper you wrote in 1968, I think. That's right. Uh, when I moved to Belfast as a professor. Yes, we'll come to Belfast later on. Um, can you, uh, for anybody who doesn't know, describe Hoare triples? Hoare triples? Yeah, uh, Hoare triples are just a, a, f a um, symbolic way of uh, saying something quite uh, simple. Um, it's a statement about what will happen if you do something. And it says, um, it has three parts, as you would expect from a triple. And the um, first part is called a precondition, and that begins, if something or other is the case in the real world, and the second part is the program it says, itself, which is a, an active um, uh, verb uh, is, that, is that if you do this then the final state of the world after you've done it will satisfy the third component of the triple which is called the post condition. Right. Now that's what it was. Can you tell us what problem you were trying to solve when you came up with the Hoare triple? Well I had, I had the idea that it would be a good idea to define programming languages in a way that um, didn't say too much about what the computer actually did because in those days anyway all computers were doing things slightly differently but uh, gave enough information to the user of the programming language to be able to predict what, whether the um, computer would do what the programmer wanted it to do. What the programmer wanted it to do was expressed as the post condition um, and served as a specification uh, for the program in the middle um, but very usually the program wouldn't work in all circumstances and required to be started in, in a state in which the precondition also held. Um, so what I was trying to do was to construct a formal proof system um, uh, calling on my previous acquaintance and love of logic uh, which would justify a, a formal proof, a mathematical proof, that the program actually does what the programmer wanted. Maybe you could say a bit more about the context uh, of the work at that time. I know from this famous uh, 1969 publication in Communications of the ACM, you make very generous acknowledgements to Floyd, now Van Leingarten and so on. But could you say what other people were trying to do with language definitions at the time you came up with your idea? Yes, the, there were two ideas of how to define a programming language current 
Um, one was the denotational semantics, which attempted to describe um, what, the prog what the meaning of the program was in terms that were familiar to mathematicians, for example, using the mathematical concept of a function. Um, and the other one was an operational semantics, which was more appealing to the uh, programmer who likes to know how, thing, how the computer is actually going to execute the program. Um, I was out of sympathy with, I couldn't understand the first of them, and I was out of sympathy with the second. Um, so I came up with this third approach, which is called the axiomatic approach, uh, which has attracted quite a bit of attention. Right, well we'll draw a lot of uh, parallels later on with your later work, but, but let's come to that mm. later. Um, Baden by Veen, the uh, formal language description languages conference. Yes. Um, there were a lot of papers there. None of them were using the approach that, or hinting at the approach that you were uh, to pioneer. Uh, I think none of them were. Um, I remember standing up to ask the question and using that as an excuse to make a comment. Um, that I felt uh, that one of the main advantages of a formal language description language was to be able to say as little as possible, as little as possible and as much as necessary, of course, about the details of the language itself. And I gave an example of defining um, the modulus of a number as uh, being um, uh, what... Sorry, I've forgotten. <laughs> anyway, let's, uh, let's leave it out. Um, I know that you also went to the uh, IBM Vienna lab and heard the uh, course, the presentations on their uh, extremely large attempt to use an operational semantics approach to define PL1. Were you uh, on the ECMA standards committee? or? I was on the ECMA. The standards committee and the course was being run for the benefit of that committee um, and it was my first uh, introduction to the uh, approach taken by by that laboratory which was I think primarily um, operational um, but they were very appreciative I, I actually sp um, spent the evenings during that conference writing the very first um, draft of the axiomatic approach paper on the note paper of the Imperial Hotel in Vienna. <laughs> I gave the manuscript uh, to my colleagues in, in IBM and they were very appreciative of it, but I think very rightly decided that the method was not sufficiently mature, shall we say, uh, to be applied immediately to PL1. What was your reaction <laughs> to the, the large definition they were writing? Oh, uh, um, withdrawal, I think. <laughs> Um, uh, definitely, um, it, I didn't regard it as, as it were, literary uh, uh, suitable for letter reading. <laughs> right. 1969, we've said the paper came out. Um, I'd like to know what you feel the reaction was from the community. Both short term, I, I happened to be at the presentation you gave in Vienna for the WG 2.2 meeting in 1969. So did people immediately appreciate that the axiomatic approach was a good way forward? And we'll come to longer term in a minute. Right, I don't know that I was so worried about impact then as we are <laughs> now. I think I was quite, quite happy with uh, the interest that people showed at these uh, technical committee meetings. Right. Longer term, of course, this is one of your most cited papers. I, I found 6,000 citations, more than 6,000 citations to that one paper. Hmm. Um, do you feel that, that that's an approach which is now widely followed? I think a lot of people do know about it. Um, and it is recognised as one of the three methods um, of expressing the semantics of a a programming language, and even a lot of people who um, 
were perhaps more comfortable with the operational approach um, did feel the necessity of proving that it was consistent with the, with the um, uh, axiomatic approach in the sense that everything you could prove um, in one system would satisfy the uh, properties uh, that you could prove of the program in the other system. So in working backwards, what I wanted to do was draw out some of the practical uh, stimulus to your chosen research topics. Um, in a paper, I guess it's the Turing Award speech, uh, you talk about the connection between the bound checking that you build in, built into your Algol compiler and the idea that they were a form of assertion. How much do you think that was an influence for you that you... Yes, I, I think the, I've always been uh, attempting to make sure that the programmer had a control and understanding of what the computer was going to do f uh, when executing the program. Um, and so the, the, the motto was that whatever happened could be explained in terms of the programming language itself and you didn't have to understand anything about the machine code or the structure of the computer in order to um, debug the program. And I think that's really a very, good, a very good principle, which has not always been observed in subsequent languages, but the necessary condition uh, for it is that the subscripts on all the array references must be checked every time. Um, and, and indeed, uh, modern languages are uh, following that example, uh, perhaps without ever having heard of it, of course. And you're, of course, talking uh, here about machines that were much slower. There was an overhead for uh, checking those array bound, that it you were was. staying within array bounds. Your customers were prepared to pay that overhead? Maybe my customers didn't know. <laughs> But uh, since most of the cu customers were academics and um, uh, had to use the computer to teach students programming, I think they were quite glad of it. Many years later, um, we, the company offered the customers the, uh, the option of building into the compiler an option for switching off the subscript checking. And they said no. They knew how many errors were due to subscript, subscript errors. Yes. <clears throat> We've not finished with the axiomatic method, but I would like to pick up on one thing which your name is always associated with, which is the Quixel algorithm and its connection to programming languages. So um, could you build the connection for us with your ability to write the program Quixel down when you first had the idea? Uh, not when I first had the idea. Um, the idea first came to me when I got interested in sorting. I remember well um, thinking about it on my couch in my room in, at Moscow State University. Um, and um, uh, the first idea I had for doing sorting was something like bubble sort. Um, and then I thought it was a bit slow. I could calculate the it would be um, n squared in the length of the array. So there must be a faster way. And I did think explicitly, well, if I could start off by assuming that um, my array was split into two uh, parts and all the elements of one part were smaller than all the elements of the other part, then, then it, I could s tackle those two problems separately. And I sat down and used the only programming language I knew at the time, which was Mercury Autocode, and wrote the partition algorithm, the easy non-recursive part. And then I was faced with the problem of how does one organize the um, calculations required to um, uh, sort all the, all the uh, partitions that you've left behind um, to sort later. And I couldn't figure that one out, but I thought there must be some way of doing it. Um, 
a, a year or two later, when I was working for Elliot's, um, I came across the Algol 60 report and I read it. That was worth reading. I, I was very, people who, who have read it agree with me that it was, you learned something about programming by reading that report. And it had that wonderful sentence in it about recursion. Any other uh, occurrence of the function designator inside the function body denotes a call of the function itself. Recursion. Ah, that's the way I should, should have described it. And that led to publication in the uh, communications of the ACM of the algorithm in their algorithm section. Right. You, you describe sitting on the couch, we'll come to back to Moscow in a while, but you describe sitting on the couch, did you have pencil and paper? How were you thinking about sorting? Um, I, was, I had pencil and paper, yes, to write the, write the program. Um, but that was after I got the idea, of course. And I don't think I ever bothered to even write out the bubble sort algorithm. Right. Uh, is it true you had a financial wager about this algorithm? <laughs> when I uh, uh, came back to England, I was offered employment by um, a small British computer manufacturer, Elliott Brothers. Um, and one of the uh, first things that um, the, my, my boss gave me to do was to write a sorting algorithm. Um, and he showed me the algorithm that he wanted written. It was the now called shell sort, um, and it was quite complicated and very difficult to see how fast it was going to be. Um, but when I'd written written it out and delivered it back to my boss, um, I said, "I think I know a faster way of doing that." And he said, "I bet you sixpence you don't." <laughs> and um, then I explained it to him, and he implemented it for um, one of the Elliott machines and found indeed it was uh, considerably faster even than his previous algorithm which had been a merge sort. For our audience, six months is uh, how much money? <laughs> well, um, about a half halfpenny <laughs> in present money. <laughs> a very small wager. Um, so we've got you at Elliot's. We've worked back to there, 1960 to 1968. That's right, yes. Um, after the sorting algorithm success, the, the next big success was the Algol compiler, I think. Yes. Could you say a bit about a bit that of, project? A bit of a surprise. In those days, um, we wrote the programs that we wanted to write, more or less, and with very little uh, management um, uh, in, uh, instruction and um, even less checking of deadlines or anything like that. And um, I worked with, um, with Jill, my wife, um, and other members of a small team. And after about a year or so, I sort of thought that maybe we could deliver it another six months or so. And so uh, I told my boss that uh, maybe we could deliver it, and he was quite Please, and he started selling it. Um, probably increased the sales of our computer quite a bit. Well, that was exciting. It's nice actually um, doing something that somebody finds useful, provided that they come back and tell you tell you this. If you're a manufacturer, however, you deliver this large chunk of paper tape embodying 10 man years perhaps of intellectual effort. And you don't, you know, it's like publishing a book. You don't, you don't hear anything about it until much later. So you've referred to the Algol description as a, a, a very valuable document. Um, my recollection is it's a very short document as well. Indeed. Um, which is was, even more impressive. It was about 26 pages of half-size uh, book for, uh, folio format. But I've heard you also give credit to a course, which I think was in Brighton. Yes. Who, who were the instructors on that course and what was the content? Uh, the, in, the instructors were Edgar Dijkstra um, and um, uh, Peter Landin and Peter Nauer. 
Um, Edsger and Peter are, of course, winners of the Turing Award. But pretty impressive uh, team to get you up to speed on Algo 60. I remember not actually doing the exercise that Peter Landon had set, but writing quicksort instead. Uh, um, rather shyly, I went up to the dais on which he was uh, sitting and showed it to him. And he looked at it for a bit, and he looked at it again. And then he said, Peter, come over here. <laughs> Right. I'm sure they weren't grading you, but you would have got a good grade <laughs> for that. So this leads very naturally into the topic of programming languages, which is one of the uh, things cited in the Turing Award. Uh, for those who've only programmed in high-level languages, could you, could you describe what it was like to program for your machine, the Elliot? 803 initially, although the main sales were on the 503 which was a faster machine, uh, um, which was built a little later. Um, programming in machine code was writing a lot of um, decimal and octal numbers on a piece of paper. And um, what else can I say? The instruction code was relatively simple for that machine. Um, and it was great fun to try and find the shortest sequence of instructions that would carry out uh, my will on the computer um, uh, with in as short a time as possible. How about design aids? So, yes, you had to write this sequence of instructions, but did you use anything like flowcharts to, to develop the design? I didn't use flowcharts, I don't think. Um, there were flowchart templates that perhaps some people used, but I think on the whole the experience was that they were only used in cases that the management insisted on it. Right. But not in my company, they didn't, my managers didn't do that. We haven't mentioned one very important member of your team. Uh, Jill, now your wife, actually worked with you on the Algol project. Indeed, she did all the, nearly all the detailed programming of it. Uh, my uh, duty was um, to write in Algol itself a sort of outline of the structure of the compiler as a whole. And I left all the, nearly all the other, rest of the work to them. Right. So programming languages, the Algol 60 compiler, um, while uh, Elliot, then a long series of other contributions to programming languages. Could you say a bit about Algol W? and how that arose. Yes, in um, 1962, I think, I was invited to become a member of the Algol Committee, the IFIP WG 2.1. Um, and the committee spent some time uh, working on um, revisions or stroke cor corrections to the original Algol 60 report and produced a new report in 1962. And then they called for um, ideas to put into the next version of Algol, um, because in those days it was expected, like machine architectures, that languages would change every few years. Um, the, um, so I, put, I made an, a number of language feature proposals, uh, which were published in the Algol Bulletin, um, and that um, caused me to be invited. I was quite an active member at the Princeton meeting of WG 2.2 um, at which they discussed the features and gave to me and Niklaus Wirth the uh, duty of uh, writing up the agreements of the meeting in, the, um, uh, in a format that would make it suitable as a definition of a new programming language. And that did not become Algol 68. Um, <laughs> yes. Are you prepared to tell the story about the schism and uh, the transition from working group 2.1 to 2.3? Well, very briefly, of, of, um, the uh, report was uh, produced and presented at the next meeting. Um, I think at Saint-Pierre it was, uh, Saint-Pierre de Chartreuse. Um, 
And um, the uh, 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 boss of the mathematical centre in Amsterdam, Art van Rijngarten, whom you know well, um, uh, had uh, during that period had, discussed, uh, had discovered a new way of defining the syntax of a programming language which he wanted to try out on this, this new language. Um, and he spent some time explaining it. I thought it was unnecessarily complicated. Uh, but he persuaded the committee uh, to give him a go, and he was charged with producing the next draft, um, which he eventually did. Um, and it went through many revisions um, and culminated in the um, um, language, language um, Algol 68. And you were not a fan of Algol 68? I'm afraid that the final meeting in 1968 at which the committee um, uh, discussed the draft and approved it, I was one of the signatories, signatories of a minority report, um, which in the words of Edgar Dijkstra was, uh, we have to regard um, as a clear description of, of the methods of programming that this report is a failure. <laughs> he didn't. He didn't mince his words. And a number of you left or resigned from Two Point One and formed a new working group. Um, yes, I wasn't one of those who either resigned or uh, formed a new working group. Um, I wasn't a founding member of it, and I did stay on in the Algol committee to look after the interests of Algol Sixty um, at a time when the committee was. Uh, mainly concerned with removing, what do you call them, ambiguities and something or other of Algol 68. Right. And when that task was completed, it wasn't a very onerous task, um, that was when I resigned. And at the same time I was invited to join the WG 2.3 on programming methodology. Yes. <coughs> Um, also on programming languages, uh, a very influential book, the Structured Programming Book. Uh, I, I fear structured programming was somewhat oversimplified by some people, but the content of that book has been very influential. Yes, um, the name Structured Programming, I think, was taken from the people you're referring to, namely your own employers, IBM. Um, and tended to be equ equated with just av avoiding go-tos. Um, but the book, uh, I think we interpreted, uh, the authors of the book interpreted it as um, uh, applying much more to the overall architectural structure of a program rather than the details in the um, of the way in which a, a flowchart has been encoded in a, in a linear programming language. And a paper I love, uh, Hints on Programming Language Design, which I think has also been very influential, although perhaps should be even more widely read. That was for the first Popple conference, I think, Principles I think of was, Programming yes. Language. But, but it wasn't in the proceedings. Were you late delivering or...? Oh, um, I don't know that proceedings were all that... Is it at all that important in those days? Maybe I think not. it would have been late. I certainly had produced it within six months um, uh, as um, a report of Stanford University. And that's presumably its end ending. That's the place. version I have, yes. 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 And then another very big uh, project uh, to which I know you, you were in which I know you were involved early on was the uh, Ada project from the U.S. Department of Defense. Yes. Could you say a bit about that? Well, I was happened to be in the United States on sabbatical um, in the uh, previous year, I think it was, um, and I took on a consultancy with the Air Force um, to write a, a report on their. Um, new programming language, which was called Jovial, Jovial J3. And I wrote a report on its various features, um, which again, I'm afraid, wasn't very compliment complimentary. <laughs> um, but the uh, report was, of course, ignored, and so was the language. The Department of Defense decided um, to start work on a, 
on a new language, which eventually became called Ada, um, and um, invited four teams to submit uh, draft proposals um, for the language without laying down very many conditions about what the language should contain. And I was asked to serve as a, as a consultant to one of, one of the teams, um, the one that worked, um, that uh, was SRI um, at that time. Um, and so I spent several trips to Menlo Park to advise them on the evolution of this language because like so many language designs it starts small and evolves um, and the um, taskmaster, the person who was masterminding the project as a whole, kept adding more features which his clients, who were of course the armed services, um, uh, required in order to gain acceptance of, of the new language. So, but in um, the SRI uh, proposal uh, was eventually uh, rejected and the successful proposal still required quite a bit of development, so I served as a consultant on that as well. Um, there was, <coughs> you say there were not very detailed requirements <laughs> on what had to be in the language, but linking back to axiomatic basis, there was one very interesting requirement on the specification of the language. I can't. Um, I believe I'm correct. I haven't gone back and looked this up, but I thought the uh, Iron Man requirements, if I got the right phrase, said that any language had to be specified either in your axiomatic style or in the operational style. I don't recall that, I'm afraid. It's certainly, I don't think any of them were in the end. I don't think I was giving, a, given, giving advice on how to draft an axiomatic language um, construction. Right. So, um, back to Elliot's again, but I'd like to postpone the operating system work to when we talk about CCS later. Um, could you explain how you came to be working for a computing company? Because, as we'll learn later on, your university degree wasn't well, there were no university degrees in computing then, but how did you get to uh, your first job being at Elliott's? In 1960, when I came back from Moscow State University, just before I came back, my uncle, who was the general secretary of a, a British Scientific Instrument Manufacturers Association, he was organizing an exhibition at which his manufacturers would exhibit their products and he invited me to um, uh, serve as an interpreter to, to, the, to the exhibitors um, and promised to pay the princely fee of £40. <laughs> so I actually cut short a holiday um, and went to um, do the interpretation and uh, found there was a computer being exhibited by Elliot Brothers, my subsequent employers. Um, and I spent most of, most of my time actually on that stand, although I did do some other interpretation of lectures. So perhaps you could uh, explain to our audience how and why you knew Russian. When I finished my undergraduate degree, um, I um, got a job, uh, sorry, I, I had to do national service and I applied there for, um, partly based on uh, connection with my uncle, who was a captain in the Royal Navy. Um, in those days, these things apparently used to count. Um, applied to um, join a course and learn Russian. And uh, they accepted me on the basis of my qualifications, no doubt, in Latin and Greek. Um, and uh, so I, I, I went up to Crail to study um, Russian in a military camp and later um, passed the examination to study it at the University of London School of Slavonic, um, a branch of the um, School of Slavonic Studies. So at that time one was conscripted for two years two to be years, in that's right. one of the services. How much of your time did you actually spend uh, 
in army uniform doing normal army things and how much time did you spend learning Russian? Oh, well, on every vaca vacation, I think it was a month, month's vacation three times a year, we would um, spend two weeks in a camp and uh, learn a bit of right. drill and learn a bit about seagoing, perhaps, <laughs> which maybe was just, just as well because part of our course in the end was to learn technical Russian to describe the um, parts of a ship. Right. <laughs> but I know from being in... Uh St. Petersburg with you, that you still speak fluent Russian. Um, I used to go back to Russia fairly um, uh, frequently to begin with um, to take uh, computer, Elliot computers to Moscow and exhibit them um, and served on the stand uh, as before to, to, to translate and generally to make things a bit easier for the exhibitors in the strange country with a strange language and so on. <clears throat> so back with Elliot, um, initially your title was probably programmer. Yes. And from there you progressed to? Senior programmer, chief programmer, chief engineer. And finally I moved out of the line of management and became um, a senior researcher, I think. Right. How, how big was the research activity within Elliot at that time? Oh, it must have been quite, quite small. Um, most of them were, was most of it was hardware research, but I met up with Mike Melia Smith, who was later the leader of the SRI um, uh, submission um, for the Department of Defence Language. Right. Um, he was my main colleague there, and we were um, commissioned to design a new version, a new, sorry, a new, uh, larger and faster version of a range of computers which the um, company was manufacturing. Right. And then for our audience who've never heard of Elliot's, can you describe the series of takeovers that led to your departure from well, the company? Yes. Um, the, the machine that we were designing never saw the light of day because the company was taken over in a very friendly way by the English Electric Company um, and so I transferred my allegiance to the English Electric Research Group who were working on a new design. Um, and then English Electric were taken over by the um, ICL, which was a conglomerate of all the remaining computer companies in, in, in Britain. Um, and um, I suppose I felt a bit sidelined, um, and I was offered, uh, sorry, I was asked in the way that academics have whether I would allow my name to go forward for consideration for appointment as a chair in Manchester. I had received a similar offer um, in Oslo, actually, uh, for the post that um, Dahl also a Turing Award winner, eventually occupied. Um, and it, it just tickled me because I'd always felt I wanted to be an academic, um, but I didn't know very much about the academic scene. And I thought maybe a job with the um, a computer, the government computer center in Manchester would give me better contact with academic uh, work in, in uh, computing in, in Britain. This was, was I right? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's another issue. Um, this is the so-called National Computing Centre. That's right. That was in uh, Manchester. Um, that was, you didn't stay there very long, I think. No, that was one of the more shameful episodes in my career. No shame at all. You were offered a very... Three months I was there, and half of it I spent under notice. I was the one who resigned. Um, because it occurred to me, rather sensibly and rather late, that maybe the best way of, of learning about the academic scene was to go for a few interviews for posts. So I um, rather tentatively um, drafted a, a, a letter of application and, and sort of wondered whether I, I would um, make it in time to catch the post. And I said, well, if I can catch the post, I'll, I'll do it. 
and I did. Uh, I went for an went for an interview, and to my intense surprise, I was chosen for the post. Do you know what the competition was like at Queen's University Belfast? Were they interviewing many people, or were you the only person no, they were considered in, good enough to interview? Um, um, several. In fact, I think I knew um, the two other. Um, no, I knew one of the other applicants who was the direct, who was. No, he was an academic. He was a member of uh, of the university already. Right. Um, no, I didn't know, know that there was a great deal of competition. So your first position in a university is as a full professor of... Indeed, yes, yes. It's uh, quite an experience coming in at the top, as it were. Can you describe the other transitions, what it was like to work in academic uh, decision-making as opposed to working in the industrial environment? Yes, I was a bit shocked when one of the first things I had to do on arrival in October... Um, was to decide um, something about the syllabuses for the next following year's courses. We never thought that far ahead in industry. <laughs> that, 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 the, the phases of industry were, were, were quite sim simple. At the beginning of the budgetary year, you expanded a bit, and at the end of the budget, budgetary year, you contracted a bit, and that was the, as far ahead as one could possibly look. But the, that, that uh, particular... Um, the other uh, thing was getting used to academic politics, which is quite different from industrial <laughs> politics. I um, realised that um, all professors were equal under the Vice-Chancellor, but you have to understand which professors are more equal than the other ones. <laughs> and the ways to influence decisions. Well, it was pretty unpleasant for the first two years, actually, because I was also director of the computing laboratory, which I took quite seriously. Um, and the um, uh, manager of the computing laboratory um, and the professor of medical statistics, um, who was chairman of the computing um, services committee, um, attempted to dislodge me, which was really quite unpleasant. Um, and in the end, I went to the Vice-Chancellor and you know, said, am I the director or am I not the director? And he said, you are the director. Um, and so I explained the problem. He said he was looked into it and he came back with the right decision. I was not the director. <laughs> that was great. That was uh, Great relief. Great relief. Um, and the unsuccessful applicant um, uh, for the ch uh, chair made a very good director after, after, me, after me. You were, I think, in Belfast from 1968 to 1978. 77, I think. 77, yes. sorry. Uh, this was, of course, a time of troubles in uh, Belfast, in Northern Ireland. Can you talk a bit about what effect that had on you personally and on the family? Well, yes, of course it had quite a strong effect. Uh, to begin with, rather, it seemed rather distant. It was over the other side of the province in, in, in uh, Londonderry. Um, but it moved to Belfast and it, it moved to the areas that you would expect in Belfast, the Falls Road and the um, Shankill Road. Um, but it did go on getting worse year by year until about 1972. Um, and so we were always wondering whether, um, whether we'd made the right choice and when we would be running for our lives. Um, the, um, but it was such a friendly place, such a lovely place to be. Um, and the and the job and my colleagues were so so wonderful that um, we really enjoyed it. Our neighbours, um, we lived in a, a road a bit like Stories Way, with um, large houses and, and uh, extremely friendly neighbours, still friends. Um, and the only time that my that Jill was really worried was when 
should I say this? I was offered another post in London. Um, sorry, I was told that I had been appointed to another post, and would I come and talk to the Vice Chancellor about it? And I probably would not have go, uh, gone unless I'd been invited to, to, uh, to be the professor. Uh, so I went for an interview and I turned them down. And Jill says that was the only time that she was really worried when I was in Belfast that she might have to come back to London. Mm. Mm. Uh, coming back to uh, the axiomatic basis theme, while you were in Belfast you, you wrote the FIND paper. This brings neatly together your sorting thing and your axiomatic basis ideas. Yes. Um, that paper had an interesting history. Uh, yes, I recounted that history at the at a Popple conference a little while ago. Um, that I uh, submitted it and had it refereed. Were you one of the referees? Yes. <laughs> no, no. Yes. <laughs> okay. You're being personal. Um, uh, and then I um, looked through it again to see how to put the um, referee's comments in and um, I couldn't understand it. Well, at least I was finding great difficulties in following the details because I was trying to prove absence of, of, of overflow as well. Um, and I thought this doesn't, doesn't uh, present the use of the axiomatic method for proof in a very good light. So I'll simplify it. I'll leave out the problem of overflow. And so I rewrote it and resubmitted it and it was published. All right. The one member of the audience at the um, Popol conference pointed out that I had been un unscientific in retracting the paper merely because it was unattractive. The business of a scientist is, a, is to present it how it is. I should have kept it in. And I, it hadn't occurred to me that I had done any wrong, and now I agree that I had. That's an interesting <laughs> insight. But to, to, to me, the transition was magic, because axiomatic, the original 1969 paper, is about proving programs you made the transition in the find paper to a development method for programs and that seems to me crucial for what has happened since. Yes, I suppose I did. Yes, thank you. I hadn't thought, <laughs> I hadn't thought about it that way, at least not for a long time. So, mm. I, I know personally you have a huge family of PhDs, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren of, of your supervision. Um, but in Belfast, you were supervising a PhD student, some PhD students, without having had one yourself. How did that feel? Oh, I don't think I felt the lack of it, no. I, I sort of feel, and I still say, that Quicksort was a good substitute for doing a PhD. Right. Tony, you, you next moved to Oxford. You were appointed to a chair at one of the most prestigious universities in the world, 1977? 1977. 1977 yeah. is when I arrived, yes, yes. Uh, and we'll say later on you stayed until 1999. Um, before we move to the technical stuff, o Oxford was your alma mater, we'll talk about that later on, but you went to Wolfson College when you went to Oxford, that's not a traditional college. That's true, so it's a graduate college, a fairly recent foundation, but as far as I was concerned, it was the right college for me because I was still somewhat in awe of the, of the traditional colleges and the senior common rooms and so on. Uh, the uh, Wilson was quite, quite democratic and very friendly. <coughs> and some very interesting people there as well, people like Robin Gandhi. Yes, indeed. Yes. Um, so one of the first things I'd like to pick up there is CSP. Um, communicating. Sequential processes. Thank you. <laughs> I didn't want to get it wrong. Um, perhaps again we could look at the context uh, and switch back to um, Elliot. Uh, you're very frank about the operating system project at Elliot not being as successful as the Algol compiler. Indeed, yes. It was 
Could you say a bit more about that? Yes, the, um, uh, uh, we realised that uh, the rudimentary operating systems that were available on our existing computers would not be adequate for uh, use of a more expensive and powerful machine. And so we, um, I was, uh, well, I took upon myself, I suppose, I was boss of the of the programming group then to design a, an operating system about which I knew nothing at all. Um, and so I, I read a few things, I learnt about uh, code words, for example, um, uh, what's now called virtual memory. Um, and we tried our best to do something, but in the end, um, it turned out the, the system could not be delivered because it was too slow. It had used a virtual memory and caused everything to thrash. And so the project was cancelled and nothing was delivered. And the entire work of my department for the last two years was <coughs> consigned to the bin, which was a bit depressing. The machines at that time had tiny stores. Yes. And the machine that we had had a particularly tiny store of only 8,000 words, um, about four times that many bytes. And it had no capability for extending the main store um, beyond that limit because that was the limit of the dressing of, of the instruction code. So whereas other, other companies that got into the same trouble, including IBM, I may say, um, were able to uh, get around the difficulty by free gifts of hardware, uh, we couldn't even give it away. Right. <coughs> and this led to a long succession of contributions to how to organise uh, concurrency, parallelism and so on. Uh, could you say a few words about monitors, for example? Yes, that was the um, result of a discovery of a way of proving the correctness of data representations. The uh, monitor was just a representation of shared data um, and otherwise had the same structure as an as a implementation of a data representation. Um, and that's, I think, what gave me the idea. Edsger Dijkstra was also uh, very interested because he had actually written a successful operating system for a, a, a computer of similar um, size and application. Um, in Amsterdam. Um, so I um, organised in Belfast a um, meeting of people interested in operating systems which led to the publication of a book called Operating System Techniques um, and which I wrote introduction to one of the chapters. Um, and we discussed um, Herbert Hansen was there and uh, he picked up on this idea that the um, updates to shared data should be all um, uh, written and understood in a single place rather than being scattered around, um, uh, which was the case in my f previous proposal uh, for um, conditional critical regions, uh, which is also mentioned in the operating systems book. Um, uh, per Brink Hansen um, uh, uh, had the opportunity to publish the idea in the communications of the ACM before I uh, thought of doing so. And um, I'm afraid I wrote uh, a follow-up, uh, um, the same idea, with very largely the same central content with a few details changed. Rather in the spirit of competition, I'm afraid. Um, and uh, people, for a number, number of years, were con uh, concerned about which of us had really invented it. Um, uh, per knew exactly how it had come. We had both invented it. And uh, he wrote a letter to me explaining exactly the order of communications and, and discussions that we'd had. Um, but um, certainly the, the paper was, um, I think, somewhat influential and it made me feel that I had really, that was the way I should have done it. Right. 
Uh, you mentioned Edsker Dijkstra in uh, connection with the operating system. I was going to ask about guarded commands and how much you feel the guarded command idea influence the development of CSP as a language? Well, the guarded command uh, itself was taken over directly um, and I think it made, um, it turned out indeed that when we formalised the semantics of CSP, um, that was exactly the way to modularize the implicit conditional. I felt it was very important that um, if a a process in, in, in parallel attempts to, perf to uh, test whether a, an output is available for further input, um, it should do so with a command that at least carried the risk that the output would take place simultaneously. Because I didn't want anybody testing the availability of something and then not using it when you found it was available. That seems to be a gratuitous way of introducing um, non-determinacy into the most critical part of a software system, which is, um, of course, the interfaces between the modules. I wanted the interfaces to be determinate, and any non-determinism should be expressed independently within the individual threads where we could manage it locally. So very influential, I think. And I, I got the syntax from him. I don't think I would have dared to make such a strange syntax uh, if, if Edgar hadn't paved the way with his beautiful guarded command. Well, I think you'd have <laughs> dared most things because we haven't come to the most radical departure in CSP, uh, the complete abolition of shared state. Yes. This is... Um, was at the time dictated um, by the structure of the implementing the microprocessors where the microprocessors were very sh uh, cheap and fast but the uh, sharing of memory between the microprocessors was expensive and slow. So the, um, one could get away with not sharing state because um, uh, it fitted the architecture of the implementation could be very, uh, it could be very fast. Um, the situation is somewhat reversed at the moment, as you understand, um, which makes shared memory more um, relevant. And I'm following developments and I hope have something to contribute to the development of our shared memory um, by, um, programming at the, um, in the future. Um, but um, I think the input-output will come back. People will realise the value of not sharing the memory, particularly in the light of the security considerations, where our shared memory is obviously offering a, a much broader um, front for attack um, by malicious software. But it was still mm. a radical departure. Did you hesitate? I mean, you'd made your own contributions to shared variable concurrency, did you hesitate for long to say there is no shared state between my processes? No. <laughs> <laughs> that was the basis Good. of the whole thing. In connection with CSP, let's mention Bill Roscoe and Steve Brooks, who were two ex extremely important PhD students you had at that time. Um, can you describe the collaboration with Bill and Steve? I describe aspects of it, I suppose. Um, the, um, uh, the task, I, um, I had written a paper on CSP and published it in the communications of the, uh, ACM in a standard uh, way, uh, practice of the time, as an informal description, illustrated by a great many um, simple but obviously seminal examples. Um, but in fact, one of the reasons why I wanted to move to Oxford was to learn the technology of giving a formal definition to a programming language from Joe Stoy um, and um, uh, Dana Scott um, in order to be able to redress the deficiency and, and, and make a formal, formal model. I realized, um, uh, but I was wanting to explore um, yet another method of defining the semantics of a programming language, which is the um, 
algebraic method. Um, so I asked them to tell me what the um, algebra of this language was going to be. And they, they came back and said, well, what do you want it to be? <laughs> and so that might have led to an impasse. But um, I think we realized, um, we must have realized that the way out of it was to do a, a denotational semantics of the language. And we worked, I worked with Bill Roscoe on that. Um, and Steve was uh, working on it too, I think. Um, of course, they've both made, uh, done far more valuable contributions to CSP than, than I have now. Um, and I'd like this opportunity of recognizing that fact. Wow. Seminal is important. <coughs> uh, influential is another thing. Let's move on to another major influence from CSP. Um, there was the Occam language and its realization as the transputer a physical chip. Can you talk a bit about how that came about? Yes, the the founder of um, a startup company in Britain, um, Ian Barron, had read my paper, the first CSP paper in the communications, and he realized that he wanted to make a computer that would execute that um, programming language. And for years I'd been saying, and Dykstra has been saying, that machines should be designed um, to implement the programming languages that, that make programming easy. And here was my opportunity, and they offered me a consultancy um, which, uh, in which I was to advise on the development of the language um, and um, any hardware implications that I could um, think of. And that led to a product which I, I don't know how many transputers were built, but how many transputer chips were built, but it was a very large number. Well, I think until the, the ARM was produced, um, it was um, Britain's big, well, biggest sell selling computer. Um, and it longest lasting, the, the, the actual architecture continued to be made for many years thereafter, and in the end it was selling something like two million a year, which by present standards is very, very <laughs> little, but by previous standards was our, um, the computer that I spend most of the time, uh, most of my time working on for Elliot's, we only ever sold 200 and they were delivered at sort of once a month. <laughs> yeah. And that led to one of the Queen's University um, Industrial Awards, I believe. Yes, well, that was the work uh, done by Bill Roscoe, actually, in the formal verification of the hardware design for the floating point unit. Um, that was uh, the first, um, I think, published uh, uh, case of uh, an error um, detected in a hardware design. Um, fortunately for, for, um, for the company, it was detected before uh, the chip was put into production. Um, a much bigger company, as you know, Intel, uh, a few years later uh, came, came across a similar um, error after the computer had been delivered. And cost them a great deal of money. Well, I think they put aside half a billion dollars, <laughs> but I don't know that they actually spent them. And a lot of people aren't terribly interested in correctness, you know. You've noticed, I think, yes. <laughs> Another mm. major project from the Oxford time, which we've recently had a retrospective conference about, was the Prokofs project. Could you describe the vision of that project? Um, the vision of the Prokofs project, project was set by our friends in Austin, Texas, um, the, inven the in inventors of the um, ACL2 um, system and, and its predecessor. Um, they had done a project to um, uh, formally verify and to get a machine checked verification for the correctness of the hardware and software for a um, uh, admittedly not an existing chip but a, a potentially viable chip design um, which was um, successful 
um, and I wanted to reproduce that technology in, um, in Europe. Uh, so that was the initial inspiration, um, but I was um, most interested in the verification of the consistency of the various uh, tools which they verified. Um, the, um, the assembly language for the computer, the verification condition generator, as well as the hardware system and the operating system. Um, and I felt the uh, wrongly, I believe now, um, that the um, uh, technology of uh, Boyer and Moore's tool uh, was not capable of doing sort of structural proofs of that kind. So we did it all manu manually in the project um, and uh, learned a lot from it, um, but there's no, no particular deliv deliverable product, as I say, except that the people who are who worked on it are still around and they're still contributing to the German verification efforts um, at the time that which more or less might otherwise have yes. been rather um, diminished. Yes, you, you corrected me. Uh, my, you corrected my omission. Uh, this was, of course, a European-wide project funded by the European Union with partners uh, in Germany and uh, Denmark. And Denmark, yes. Um, another line which began during the Oxford time was the unifying theories of programming uh, with your colleague or visitor, Hei Ji Fung. Um, would you like to say a few words about the objectives? I think we'll come back to it when we talk about clean air algebras later on. But the, the um, goal of unifying theories, uh, of course, is one that I, I got from the current efforts by physicists to unify the theories of the four forces. Um, I realized that there were more theories out in the published literature than any one person could uh, comfortably <laughs> read in a lifetime. Um, and uh, wanted, therefore, to um, find some way of unifying them in the scientific sense that, that the unified theory would be a, a generalization of the other theories but would not supersede them. One, one doesn't wish to uh, create an antagonism that you, you're trying to supersede the solutions which have been developed uh, very often to deal with particular ap application areas and particular system architectures and which are not invalidated by a general theory which, shall we say, is um, instantiated by no application and no architecture, which is what we were looking for, actually. Um, it's nice to be a theoretician. Could you say a few words about collaboration? Uh, I, people read your final papers and think these are such gems. They must come uncut uh, directly oh. from your pen. <laughs> I happen to know quite a few drafts. Well, I did, I did confess to that in, in the uh, essays in computer science. Um, yes, I, I regard um, writing a specification or writing an article as the first test of a theoretical idea. That uh, one needs to find a way of expressing it that sort of makes it, feel, makes it seem inevitable that there couldn't be a better way of describing this particular phenomenon. Um, and so carry the reader with what might otherwise seem to be a series of arbitrary definitions um, through to the place where the punchline could be delivered. And I'm still doing it, I'm afraid. So Oxford, major university, when you went there, the department was Tiny. Yes, there was me and Joe Stoy and two programmers. <laughs> and many practical problems. Can you talk about growing the MSC, moving the department from one building to another and all of the things that you had to attend to as well as your research? Um, I think you just about sum summarised <laughs> it <laughs> in the um, terms most appropriate. Yes, the... the um, 
Setting up anything new at Oxford at that time was very difficult. <laughs> and um, I was a, a, um, nearly all the time a member of the Faculty of Mathematics. And I had been a member of the Faculty of Science in, um, in Belfast and had learnt fairly quickly and, and exploited my knowledge of how to influence that committee to make a decision in my favour. Um, and um, eventually learned how to, how to do it you know, pretty well so that I could predict what was going to be uh, passed and really avoid wasting time on something that is not likely to actually pass muster. Um, when I got to Oxford, everything was turned on its head because um, in, in Belfast one could make an argument based, for example, on the public perception. But what would the public think if you knew if they knew that you were doing this sort of thing? Or you could uh, you could base it on the um, uh, potential benefits to for the up application exploitation of the research. Um, these arguments carried no weight at all in the Faculty of Mathematics at that time. Um, starting up a new course was something that the university was was able to contemplate, sort of exaggerate slightly once every decade. You know that was fast enough to. However, there was a there was a predecessor. The the, the um, Department of Material Science had um, had had a even more spectacular uh, rate of growth for a number of years, and they, they, they knew how to, how to do it. But they were in a different faculty, Natural Sciences, which was more used to this kind of thing. I was in the Faculty of Mathematics. And then Mrs. Thatcher, bless her for this at least, made, it, made a, an offer of money to found new posts. The first one was associated with the graduate course that we wanted to set up. And the next four were um, associated with an undergraduate course, which I then wanted to set up, a joint degree, degree course with, with mathematics. I was, I was very pleased to be in a mathematics faculty because I knew that mathematical talent was the way to recruit good programmers, good computer scientists. And of course, Bill Roscoe and S Steve Brooks were case, case in point. Um, but um, then we got additional, slightly lesser numbers of um, outside money to support posts to set up new degrees. Because no politician wants to support something that already exists, and therefore you need to set up a new, group, new degree if you wanted to expand. So the number of new degrees I uh, started in Oxford must, I don't know, the record probably still stands. Hope so, hope so, because it's, it's not really much fun. And of course the college system, which is so valuable uh, for undergraduates in Oxford, acted as a break in the sense that you had to get the buy-in of all of the colleges. Yes, in every post um, that is offered by the university is a joint post, a joint appointment with a college, and the college is... Mostly, they're mostly fairly traditional col um, um, uh, colleges are teaching fairly traditional uh, subjects. And the only um, reason why the colleges were willing to accept a new subject was because uh, Mrs. Thatcher, uh, bl bless her for this too, cut the funding of the universities and restricted the number of places that the universities are allowed to take. And each of the posts that were associated with the subsequent generosity had ten college places associated with it. So it was just the right bribe to get the uh, foot into the, into the door. But there's no... <laughs> there are problems with dealing with colleges as well, as you know. <laughs> Not with Wilson, but with the undergraduate colleges. 
and eventually retirement in retirement in quotes came mm. along from Oxford in 1999. That's right. I reached the standard age limit for retirement in, at the university. And we had time. a very nice conference to mark the end of your time in Oxford, I remember. Um, a lot of people might have uh, stopped work at that time. You instead? Well, I got an offer from the director of the um, research laboratory just being set up in Cambridge by Microsoft. And Cambridge, UK. Cambridge, UK. Um, and the director, Roger Needham, um, uh, offered me a post. He'd offered me a post two years previously, but I thought I was needed in, in Oxford at that time still. Uh, I think maybe I was wrong, but um, my last two years weren't very productive um, after Ji Fung left. Um, and um, so I took it. Oh, well, I, I spent a, a half year sabbatical up in Cambridge to um, test the taste, test the waters and brought Jill with me, of course, because she would um, have to agree. Um, and we both liked the place. And um, when I heard from the, found, from the founder of the Microsoft Research Laboratory, the principles under which the, the laboratory was uh, founded were to employ the best people and give them their heads, let them do the research that they felt was um, important uh, the only thing that he did require was that the um, uh, recruits should have uh, fire in their belly and want to change the world. Maybe I did. So can you describe uh, how you saw Microsoft? You, you'd been in industry in the UK early on. You now joined the largest software company in the world. Um, did you feel it was right for exploiting more formal methods? Did you feel that the methods they were using were adequate? I'm thinking of a famous paper of yours. <laughs> well, um, when I wrote the axiomatic method paper, I, th I thought that the a topic of verification of programs using the axiomatic method um, would not be of interest to um, industry for a number of years and during the time that is not inter um, of interest to the in industry it was appropriate for academic research um, because industry was obviously going to have far much, much more money than a university to pursue the research and therefore the sensible academic will withdraw if the industry is looking after the field. Um, and I wanted to see whether that um, prediction was correct um, and indeed it was um, Microsoft was not using formal methods not for several years but when they came to use it uh, from necessity not for the reasons that I myself predicted was that in the end the thumb error would cause um, human loss of human life perhaps um, but because of the virus, which I'd never predicted, and nor had Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And so they, they turned to um, an element of formal methods, the analysis of programs, as a method of countering uh, the threat of the virus. I believe that human evolution was driven in much the same way, actually. You've already hinted at this, uh, but would you like to say a bit more about the research ethos, the ease of getting people with fire in their belly, pursuing their own ideas in an environment like a, an industrial research lab versus in universities as you last worked in them, or even as you know them <coughs> today? Well, the thing that worked well in the universities is that the universities were able to collect teams um, to undertake projects which are larger than a single theorist could um, match. Um, and this worked very well, um, uh, very well indeed. People did, did pull together and uh, produce and demonstrate ideas uh, to the development organization in Microsoft, um, many of which found their way into Microsoft products. Um, and uh, 
uh, that sort of um, prospect of um, eventual delivery was what the motivated the research and motivated the collaboration. Uh, university research is is much more fragmented because the university is going to have a, a very small team working in any particular area area of research, and the uh, needs of teaching require that even those are diversified, um, and therefore most collaborations in universities at the level of staffing that we, that we then enjoyed were between universities, mm. which is quite an overhead. Um, building teams of theorists is actually very much more difficult than uh, teams of engineers. Um, it's much more competitive. So very, uh, very, um, there are no agreed criteria as to how you, how you judge between two theories if all that you're producing is theories. You need some form of experimental use of the theory in order to make that choice. And a project that makes a theory usable, that is a tool that m enables ordinary programmers to take advantage of the theories, is a multi-man year project. Right. And takes many, um, perhaps 15 years even to mature after the originators have put in a lot of work on it. Um, it doesn't really... Um, recruit a uh, productive and reactive user base for up to 15 years. Right. So that's, you have to be very brave to embark on a project like that. Well, bravery has never been lacking. Um, <laughs> can we come right up to date on your own research? Um, and I don't expect in this interview to go through the full detail of clean air algebras. But, but could you build the connections between what you're trying to do now with the algebraic approach, what you were trying to do in unifying theories, and what you were trying to do in a, axiomatic basis? Well, yes. Um, starting with the axiomatic basis, the first part of the axiomatic, axiomatic basis used um, an, uh, an algebraic approach to um, uh, illustrate how you could axiomatize a branch of arithmetic. Um, and you could give different axiomatizations uh, to different kinds of arithmetic, which at that time were, were uh, an option, even in the hardware of the computer. Um, you could con uh, tune your axioms to des describe exactly the kinds of binary arithmetic and uh, sine plus modulus arithmetic that were, that were uh, fashionable um, at that time. Um, and if I'd maintained that tradition, um, which I got, got by looking at standard algebra books in, in, in mathematics, I would have come, come about uh, with the idea um, of presenting the um, axioms as um, uh, equations in an algebraic form rather than as proof rules. Um, in, in the form of four triples. It was only a whisker's breadth, as it were. I just did not get the right idea at the right time. Um, even when I was unifying, writing the book on unifying theories, um, what I was doing was constructing a model of the theories using Dana Scott's method, the den denotational semantics, um, to cover a great number of um, theories of, of how programs worked. Um, and it was, again, one of those chance discoveries lying on a sofa that um, led me to believe that one could actually present the, um, an adequate treatment, a usable treatment of the meaning of a programming language in a few algebraic axioms which are almost identical with those that apply not just to programs, but to numbers as well. Simple laws of associativity, um, commutivity, dis and distribution were exactly what you need in order to reason about programs and ensure their correctness. Um, and I discovered a very simple proof um, in which I defined my own triple 
or sorry, the whore triple, it's not really my own, um, in terms of the algebraic operation of sequential composition and derived the proof rules from the algebraic axioms by um, a perfectly standard style of logical um, uh, ver um, justification. So that was a surprise, and I've been talking about it ever since. <laughs> but each of those earlier steps that you're now somewhat critical of spun off enormous amounts of other work, and I can't help wondering if you'd started with cleaner algebra as if any of us had understood it. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> quite, or um, the Kleene algebra, um, the real, actually the advance was triggered by a discovery that I could do this for a new form of logic, um, uh, logic of programs, a new, a new definition of the triple uh, that had appeared recently as a result of the work of Peter O'Hearn um, called separation logic. Um, I was uh, looking at the proof rules uh, which express the um, semantics of separation logic in terms of four triples and I discovered uh, the law which enables me to treat concurrency um, in the same way as sequential composition um, and that I think was really not only unification of theories um, but unification of two central ideas which are now central to computing um, concurrency and sequentiality um, into a single simple algebraic framework. And since then I've discovered that Robin Milner's operational semantics could be similarly defined um, in terms of the algebra of the semicolon operator and all of his laws, his laws of operational semantics could be derived from um, the uh, algebra as well. So, well, yes, very satisfactory. <laughs> and still busy. Ah, oh, yes, well, I'm, um, I am hope, um, trimming the edges a bit and um, uh, trying to go back to a, a denotational semantics, um, which is um, really based on, on um, uh, the needs of people who are debugging their programs. Um, a person who is debugging a program needs to see a comprehensible trace of the behavior of that program um, uh, together with an indication of where the fault has been detected and with um, the ability to uh, trace back in the program to all the places which might, who, um, which, uh, might have to be changed um, in order to get rid of that fault. So that, that one has a, um, a sort of graphical um, a picture of arrows and chains of arrows leading back from a symptom to their causes uh, to help you um, discover and diagnose and correct the error. So just, just as the um, Hoare triples were designed to help people to prove programs, and the Milner uh, similar r rules, the operational rules designed to help people who are um, compiling and implementing the programs, uh, my new denotational semantics based on graphs is an attempt to uh, provide the theory which is directly applicable to the testing and um, uh, correction of programs. So I'm trying to bring that particular uh, branch of um, programming methodology under uh, uh, theoretical control as well. I'd like to change gear. Uh, some of our audience I'm sure would like to know more about Tony Hoare the person. Uh, you weren't actually born in the UK. <laughs> I was born in, in Ceylon, now called Sri Lanka, in, in Colombo. Um, my father was a, a British civil servant, um, part of the, uh, among the rulers of the, of the country. Uh, and my mother was the daughter of a tea planter, which doesn't mean somebody who plants tea, but somebody who looks after a tea estate 
and looks after people who plant tea and collect it and dry it and um, manufacture it. Do you remember things about Ceylon as it then was? I remember a, f a few things. I went back there when I was 70 and took my family back on a, on a holiday trip. Um, and there were one or two things that I remember, not as many as, as I might have. I mean, it was mostly fairly... Yeah, I actually meant, do you remember things about living there when you were a child? or? Oh, yes. I, I remember going to school there. Um, and um, uh, the incidents, going, going into the jungle to see um, elephants and um, uh, tigers, sorry, leopards and bears and buffalo, all of them pretty dangerous. Uh, the headmaster of the school took us on a school party to Yala. Um, where we stayed in the rest house and uh, went around in this old bus to water holes to see what animals we could see. Fascinating. And you then had to move away, still not back to the UK immediately? Um, after, this is, uh, uh, um, we, we, uh, my mother and my two brothers um, moved to Rhodesia during the war. Um, because of the threat of an imminent invasion of, of Ceylon. And we spent a couple of years in Rhodesia and South Africa before going back. Uh, the school that I'm talking about was in the, oh, the brief interval um, between returning to Ceylon and returning to Britain. Re returning, of course, in two <laughs> different senses. <laughs> all the English, room, uh, all the English in, in Ceylon regarded returning as being uh, returning to the United Kingdom. And your first school back in the UK was? Well, it was the Dragon School in Oxford, a rather superior prep school uh, where I spent just under two years and got a scholarship to a public school in, in Canterbury, King's School. Which leads on to your, uh, uni your first university degree uh, which wasn't an obvious preparation for computing. Could you explain what the degree of greats is? Yes, um, it uh, quite a, uh, has quite an ancient tradition in Oxford. Um, it consists of four subjects, uh, Latin and Greek, language and literature, um, well that's four already, um, Latin and Greek history, and ancient and mo modern philosophy. So. Um, it's a four-year course with an exam in, in the middle, um, in which I did um, moderately well, um, but not sufficiently well to gain a um, research grant to do a doctoral research in, in philosophy at Oxford, which is what I would otherwise have done. Fortunately, I That may have saved <laughs> computing. <laughs> I think it saved me from possibly rather um, uh, a career for which I was not... What made you Ideally choose fitted. Um, Well, um, at the public schools in those days, all the, all the brightest students studied Latin and Greek. And um, history was for those who can't. And scientists, well, nobody knows why they take up the subject. So I was always interested in mathematics. I got quite good marks in mathematics for as long as I was studying it. And I went on to study... Uh, mathematics and just for fun of it from popular textbooks um, and uh, I acquired an interest in philosophy through the philosophy of mathematics through reading books by Bertrand Russell for example um, and C. E. M. Jode who was quite a popular philosopher in those days um, and certainly it was um, the study of philosophy and particularly the philosophy of mathematics and the foundations of mathematics uh, that led me into a computing, taken interest in computing. You were at Merton College, I think. Presumably that's a very traditional college. Very traditional. Claims to be the oldest. I'm there because my father was there. <laughs> <laughs> but presumably offered you lots of scope to pursue your interest in philosophy and logic and so on. It wasn't a tightly constrained course. 
Well, the course was a fairly massive course, as all university courses seem to be after secondary school course. Um, but um, the, uh, we all had personal tutors, and the personal tutor would advise us, uh, set us an essay subject every, every week in, in um, philosophy or ancient history. And so we went out to look at the literature which he also recommended. No, I, I don't. It, I mean, I studied logic in my spare time, but we did have spare time, for goodness sake. I read, um, I studied it from Quine's book on mathematical logic. And around this time, you met your first computer, the Mercury, I think. Uh, was that while you were an undergraduate, or was that in the master's course that followed? Uh, that was in the master's course. I attended a course run by Leslie Fox who was my later head of department when I came, uh, came back to um, Oxford as a professor. And that was a course in statistics, not I, in uh, the, programming as after, such? Um, after my national service, and where I learnt Russian, um, I thought I'd better do something a little bit more practical. So I registered for a course at the unit of biometry just to get a diploma in statistics, one-year course. Um, and um, managed to persuade them that I knew enough mathematics to, to um, stand the pace. Um, and that, that enabled me, well, I very much enjoyed that. I mean, I, statistics is still something that I find interesting, and it's um, getting more interesting for computer scientists, too. And then there's the machine translation uh, connection. Could you knit that into the story for me? Um, machine translation was was a bit of a, a um, uh, flash in the pan. Uh, when I was in Moscow, I got a letter from the National Physical Laboratory at Teddington um, offering me a post as a senior scientist to uh, work in a team of programmers who were attempting to uh, program a Automatic translation from Russian to English on a pilot, no, not the pilot ace, the ace computer at the National, which was, if you remember, a very primitive computer. Um, so I took up an interest in the subject and I studied it in, in Russia, um, more or less neglecting my statistical studies, which I should have, should have perhaps paid attention to, um, but were a bit beyond me. Um, and that was how I got interested in sorting. Yes, I was going to make sure we <laughs> built that link. So large dictionaries of words needed sorting, yes? Yes, because the dictionaries were held on magnetic tape, and if the words were sorted before you started the magnetic tape whirring, then you could pick up all the words in the sentence on a single pass of the take, tape, which might very well take 20 minutes. <laughs> the um, uh, so how did I get? Sorry, what was the question again? Well, the, just the link between uh, machine translation and your eventual quicksort algorithm, the the design. Oh of right, the you were <laughs> angling for that story then. So we've already mentioned Jill, Jill Pym, uh, before she married you. Uh, you were married in 1982? 1962. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, January 62. Uh, children, grandchildren? Yes, we have um, our three children. Um, Tom first. Um, he's now a um, security expert working in the um, research facility of Huawei in Banbury, Oxford. Um, my daughter Joanna um, is married, is sorry, her partner is a city architect in Vienna and she lives in Vienna and learnt German and is now working as a, an organiser for um, the Buddhist community in Europe. Um, and uh, my youngest son was uh, Matthew, um, was um, uh, a bright schoolboy, but he unfortunately succumbed to leukemia some time ago, in well, 1982. Um, 
And he was very clever, and amusing, bright and extraordinarily kind and considerate person. Real, real, real fun to begin with, to be, to be with. Um, and he left us with many happy memories. Mm. You've lived in houses, I gathered earlier, more than one in Barnet. Yes. Uh, that's North Belf London. North London, yes. Of course, Belfast, which we have talked about. Then you lived in Oxford. Yes. And now here. Actually, ignoring for the moment the spells in the States, not, not too many moves in your, no, in your life. No, eight, eight years for industry, nine years in Belfast, 22 years in Oxford. Wow. <laughs> um, I keep remembering that this is twice as long as Mrs. Thatcher was Prime Minister, and that was too long. <laughs> and now we were 16 years working for Microsoft in the research department. Yes. And there were two spells in America at least. Yes, uh, the first one was uh, six months, um, where I was hosted by Don Knuth, um, and uh, wrote a number of papers. Um, and met the Palo Alto Research Center of Xerox, which was the leading, really leading computer science uh, laboratory um, uh, in America at the, t at the time. Um, and then a year in Austin, Texas with Edsger Dijkstra, um, which was uh, wonderful. The famous year of programming. The year of programming, yes. We organized a series of seminars, which we called the year of programming. And I'm hoping to go back there next year to renew acquaintance and uh, celebrate um, the retirement of a close friend and colleague. Well, to move towards wrapping up, um, as well as the Turing Award, 1980, uh, the enormously prestigious Kyoto Prize in the year 2000, honorary doctorates. Uh, can you remember the first and the most recent, perhaps? Yes, yes. The first was at the University of Southern California. Um, and I think it was organized by Per Brink Hansen, who was a good friend of mine. I, he's a great man. Um, and um, the um, most recent were at um, in Europe, um, also uh, Madrid and um, St. Petersburg. Right. And at least 10 in between those. So, uh, oh, what, well, nearly perhaps, I don't a know. A lot of honorary doctorates. <laughs> fellow of the Royal Society, fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering, a knighthood in the year 2000. That was a good year. Yes, it was a good year. <laughs> that was my first year at, at Cambridge. Right. I met the uh, president of China, the Mikado of um, Japan, and the Queen, all in the same year. So it was actually the Queen who conferred the knighthood. Indeed it was, yes. Uh, many collaborations and along the way, and in many cases, those collaborations have established that person's main scientific thrust. Um, do you work best in collaboration, do you feel? I, uh, I haven't made it. I work a, a lot by myself now. I think I do, um, I do enjoy being, well, I need somebody else to keep me on the rails. Um, Class, we have filled that role for some time, heard you fun for a very long time. Yes. Um, and uh, admittedly, they do quite a lot of the hard lifting. And uh, I'm very grateful to them. Well, Tony, thank you very much. It's been a very interesting discussion, and I'm sure our audience will enjoy hearing something about the way you do research and about you as a person. Thank I you. hope so. But it has been very much a pleasure to meet you again and answer your questions again. Thank, Thank you. you.